Welcome to Networking into Freelance ID and HPT Jobs and More, Approaches, Strategies, Tools, Outcomes, and Lesson Learned. I'm talking shop here today um, through the Opal-sponsored webinar series with Vanessa Alzante, Jennifer Chen, David Koster, Megan Murtaugh, Nicole Pepianu, Tommy Selak, Lindsay Shepard, and Kara Wright, and of course our audience participants as well. I remember when my professors first told me that I should network, uh, I really didn't know what that meant. I was so green to corporate work. So my goal here today is to help others learn about networking, why it's so important and how to do it. Just to be clear, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the Opal Webinar Archive website so that others can gain access to it in the future. So today we get to meet and talk with some professionals who work as um, instructional designers, learning experience designers, and performance improvement specialists. They've each developed their careers and expertise uh, through both hard work and networking. And I met each of these individuals by networking. I got to know them mostly on Facebook and LinkedIn, social media, their websites, and also at conferences. And I kind of did this as a proof of concept to demonstrate that you too can make valued connections online and at a distance. You can make valued professional connections that lead to new experiences and opportunities through networking. In fact, I've built my entire career um, on a solid theoretical foundation, technical knowledge and skills, a lot of hard work, substantial grit, and growing quite a thick skin, but most importantly through networking. So let's get started. By the end of the webinar, I hope you will be able to identify at least one inspirational person who used networking to land a freelance or permanent ID position with whom you can relate on some level. Also, I hope you can identify at least four networking strategies, approaches, how-to tools that you can use now and later on in your career. Each of our seven panelists will start by telling their career development story and they started either as a teacher or a trainer or an ID or from something else. And they got into this from right out of their master's degree uh, graduation program or during their program. Also, they will each describe their favorite networking behavior strategies um, that they implemented during the beginning of their careers to develop their social networks, their favorite networking behaviors and strategies that they implement now if there are any different. Some of the specific outcomes, both tangible and intangible, personal and professional, that they got from their efforts described previously, then and now, and the lessons learned um, about what to do and not to do. At the end of the question, at the end of the session, there will be a, an open Q and A session. So, you can please type any questions that arise into the chat box as we go. And during the Q and A, I will facilitate a discussion regarding the questions you've asked and any more that might arise. So let's take it away. Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for the uh, for letting me be first. <laughs> Hi, it's nice to see everybody. I'm Nicole Papiano. If you do recognize me, it's most likely by my brand, your instructional designer, or um, some of the workshops I host through my learning network, the Upskill Experience. I got into ID sort of the backwards way like most people. Um, I started off as a writing center consultant, which somehow led to me designing programs for um, writers at the university. And as I walked into my PhD program, I was teaching writing classes to college students. Um, and then, you know, adjuncting is wonderful, but also not really great on the finances. And so about three years into my program, I decided I wanted to do something full time. I saw a position for an instructional designer, which is something I literally never heard of before. And I was like, oh, I do curriculum development and I make things online and I've taught online and I know how to create programs. This sounds good. And uh, my employer agreed. <laughs> so they hired me. Um, I was living in New Jersey at the time and this position was in Los Angeles. And we did a, a, an eight week contract. That was my first time doing a contract job that turned into a full-time role. And eventually I wound up um, managing their whole department, which was about 15 instructional designers. And we worked with a video and graphics team and I did a lot of the um, client relations and things like that. So that was pretty cool. And then once I left there, uh, you know, the timing was just, it was just right, I guess. But uh, my time there ended and I found myself doing a contract and I didn't really think at first that that was going to be 
um, you know, the long-term plan for me. I really thought that I was just going to do this eight month contract and then go look for another full-time role. Um, but four years later, I'm still doing just freelance work. So I don't have a full-time job with the company. I am my own boss, which is kind of fun. So the strategies I want to talk to you about today, um, there's four of them. And so the first one is, is really easy to go do like right after this, this call. And there are social media groups on Facebook and LinkedIn that are full of people who are interested in the same exact things you are. Um, there's freelance groups, there's ID groups, there are organizational development groups and through like-minded peers and through people who are maybe a little more experienced than you, if you're participating, um, not only can you get valuable information and sort of have this live stream of resources, but you can also really get to know folks and um, through your participation, they'll see that you're really sharp and you've learned a lot, I'm sure, in your program over at Boise State. And so, um, you know, sometimes that will flag people to go look and seek you out later to do work if you're interested in freelance work or um, to offer jobs to, which is pretty cool. The other short term goal I'd say you can probably turn around and do tomorrow is to just go find other instructional designers or, um, you know, human performance trainers, whatever niche you're interested in. Go find someone who's more experienced and inspires you and just shoot them a LinkedIn mail or um, an email, an Instagram message whatever, you'd be surprised. People in our field are really nice. And most of the time, if you have a specific question or if you just want to get to know them, they're more than willing and open. And that makes you uh, kind of top of mind for them later as well. Then longer term, and these are things I didn't do till later, but um, you, you could do them now. I don't think it's early career versus late career, but local business groups. So um, a few weeks ago, I started volunteering with SCORE. I had done some of their um, women's meetings, like women's networking lunches and things like that when I lived in California. And, um, so I wanted to get reinvolved with them here on the East Coast where I now live. And from SCORE, they referred me to TEDx, Asbury Park, um, to do a training session that I had run for SCORE with them. And then from there, I got a job with a client that um, we kick off our project next week. So, you know, the SCORE group is great and any local business group, maybe Chamber of Commerce, um, small business meetups are really great because that's where you're gonna find people who are experts but are not necessarily performance experts or learning experts. So they're looking for your expertise and once they get to know you on a human level, then they're more likely to want to work with you. And then, and that kind of tags with the outsiders. So don't just follow people in your industry and don't just get involved with people in our industry as wonderful and as fun and um, you know, giving as we are. For most people, learning folks aren't going to be your target market. You know, you're going to be looking for consulting contracts or positions maybe within organizations. And if you only stick to people in the learning field, then you're kind of only preaching to the choir and people aren't going to see that you're an expert and that they could use your help. And so that's, um, those are like the four big, quick and, and dirty ones that I would recommend for you to get started with right now. I think of all of the spaces, because I'm all over social media, honestly, I use LinkedIn, I use Twitter, I use, um, I use YouTube now, I use pretty much everything. I would say, if, if nothing else, make sure that you're using LinkedIn and, and get your profile really solid. Um, make sure it has the keywords that folks are looking for. It's been my number one source of leads. And honestly, through using social media, I can say that um, after my first year in business, I never again had to go looking and asking for people to give me work. You know, that first year after my contract ended with my first client, I, I kind of forgot that there would be a time when that contract ended. And I had to go look for something. And um, so I, I made all those mistakes early and I found out that if I just was more visible and accessible that those folks would come to me. And so that's really what's happened since I've started being uh, more visible on social media. And um, the other thing is that it's really also led me to connections with folks in the field, like I mentioned. So I am running an e-learning freelancer bootcamp with Robin Sargent and Christy Tucker, who you may or may not know, but I actually met both of them 
through social media, through the internet. I've never met either of them in person and we've done really awesome work together. So that is something that would not have been possible if I didn't get myself online and I didn't start using those mediums, not just, you know, to post my stuff and to be salesy, but also to make real genuine connections and talk to people. So I would definitely say, um, you know, you, you just want to be out there. You want to be visible because people want to work with people they know more so than anything. It's, it's not, it is about qualifications, of course, but, you know, if 15 people have the same resume and the same qualifications, the one who sticks out is the one that someone feels a personal connection to and, and feels like they know and can trust. And it really is about genuinely being interested and not just being salesy. You know, as much as I say that, like, I'm out there and visible, my hope is really that I'm talking to people and connecting with people and these things come to me organically because people like my message. And so the last thing I would leave you with is if you're going to do the things I mentioned today, I know there's going to be a lot of pressure because the people who are out there on the internet usually only show the wonderful things that they're doing. And it can feel really competitive, um, even if it's just internally, right? You feel like you need to meet some bar that exists, but be genuine and be yourself. Obviously, don't, you know, throw out the baby with the bath water and just like totally be unprofessional, but do be genuine and authentic because you're going to attract people who are interested in the ways you think and the ways you do things. And those are the people you want to work with. You don't want to feel like you're stifled and in a box and trying to find people um, and make them like you. You want people who appreciate and value the work you do and the, the things that you bring to the table. Yeah. So those would be my, my strategies for you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, but that's some awesome wisdom. I really appreciate your, your sharing with us today. Thank you. And um, next up, we have Tommy. Hey there. Um, well, I don't know how I'm going to follow Nicole. Her slide was awesome and everything she shared was just incredible, but I will do my best. Um, my origin story, I was a middle school teacher and decided that, you know, I'd like to make more than $35,000 a year, got a family to feed. Um, so I got a job selling e-learning and LMS systems for Pearson Education. Turns out I wasn't so great at sales. Um, in fact, uh, we had to do a lot of cold calling and I failed my call metrics spectacularly. So they started letting me do the sales presentations and some of the training on their LMS platforms. Um, and that led me to going out in the field and working in K-12 school districts, doing the implementation, customizing e-learning um, for, for the clients and things like that. And I realized, you know, I really like this. Uh, so I started applying for instructional design jobs and I got really lucky and was hired to be the instructional design manager for Steak and Shake. And that was my first job as an instructional designer that I was completely unprepared for and probably unqualified for, but I had a great mentor who coached me on developing e-learning, um, developing job aids, creating menus for Steak and Shake, just doing the entire thing. And so that really launched my career. Um, and now I work as a senior learning experience designer for Catalyte. What I do is design uh, digital learning experiences and products. The product I'm working on right now is called Odyssey, and it's a combination of a proprietary coaching platform and uh, learning experience platform where we take software developers um, and upskill them into more senior roles. And our kind of our secret sauce is that we use data science to predict folks who are, you know, coming from lower income areas, maybe didn't have the same educational opportunities as everyone else. We use AI to predict if they would make a strong software developer candidate. And then we take them through our entire training program um, from, you know, having absolutely zero tech background to a full stack software developer. And then they work for us as an apprentice for two years. Um, and we, cl we contract them out with clients. So it's, it's been amazing. Uh, I love this field. I love what I do now. Um, and I think one thing I wanted to share is I did it all with just a 
bachelor's degree. I'm just now going back and getting my master's degree. It's only through networking and LinkedIn and like selling myself that I've made it this far. So uh, if anything, I, I'm hoping that I'm boosting everyone else's self-esteem because if I can get here, anybody can. <laughs> so um, just know that it's really about your skills um, and your experience. And from what Lisa's told me about this program at Boise State, you're all going to be extremely well prepared, definitely more so than I was um, if you're trying to break into this field. So that's outstanding. Uh, in terms of my early career networking, um, I didn't do enough of it. That's probably my number one lesson learned from my early career. I always thought of LinkedIn as kind of this stuffy platform where I had to be super professional. I was scared to share, you know, my authentic self. I had a lot of imposter syndrome. So um, it took me a long time to get over that. But finally, I started connecting with uh, influencers on LinkedIn and um, putting myself out there more just all the time. And that has led to all kinds of opportunities to go on different podcasts. Um, Nicole mentioned Robin, Robin Sargent. I went on hers last year and kind of told my origin story there. Um, that led to me going on then Alexander Salas's podcast and uh, the TLD podcast, and then getting uh, the chance to present at a conference, which unfortunately got canceled due to COVID-19, but I'm still hoping to do that presentation. But it's all about just getting out there and getting over your imposter syndrome and, and making those connections. Um, and I think one of the other things that held me back was that I was afraid that the things I was saying and the content I was sharing had, you know, had already been done to death by folks with PhDs who had more experience than I do. Um, but there are always new people coming into this field. There's every day someone who you can connect with that hasn't experienced what you have. Nothing any, one of, any of us create is ever completely new or proprietary. We're just kind of regurgitating what's come before. Um, read, a few, read a few instructional design textbooks and you can literally see the chain going all the way back <laughs> to Gagne and the folks who kind of started this whole thing. So um, if you have an idea for a piece of content that you might find that you think folks will find helpful, share it. That is the number one way to grow your LinkedIn network, I think, is just providing useful content, not just salesy stuff. But hey, here's an instructional design model that worked for me. Here's a case study of how I solved the problem. If I create something good, if I create a great job aid, I, I put that template out there and say, hey, here you go. Um, and that drives people to my website. Um, that builds my network and my correct connections have grown from like 500 to over 3000 um, connections over the last two and a half years organically that way. Um, another tip that I have for folks as you get into the field and um, especially if you're, you're a couple of years in is to find a mentor in the industry and specifically within like the industry you're interested in, like software development, or if uh, you want to go into the military, because this job looks so different depending on which industry or field you're in. Um, what I do now is leagues different than what I did for the restaurant industry, you know. Um, and I think if you can find a mentor in industry, that person can help you chart your career path and figure out what you want to do, you know, which of this which of these thousands of skills you're seeing on job descriptions do you really want to hone in on? And they can open doors um, to you uh, for career opportunities too. Um, my last tip, build a strong personal brand and think entrepreneurially about yourself, regardless of if you're pursuing freelance or corporate work. 90% uh, of my work has been in corporate, um, in full-time positions. I've only had one contract that was about six months long. But I still think of myself as a business, as a freelancer. I have a professional website with my portfolio and I share it. I brand myself and I stay engaged in the community just like I was looking for freelance work. And my inbox is always full of career opportunities even when I have that switched off because my name just gets out there. And I'll mention LinkedIn has an algorithm and they prioritize your profile based on how active you are. Additionally, um, I was considering a role at Amazon in the not so distant past and found out that when Amazon, when you apply through LinkedIn to work with them, they pull your connections and look at who you're connected with at Amazon. And they look at those relationships on the back end of their system. The little look at, I had a little look at there. 
at their platform. So um, that stuff matters now more than ever. Analytics is everything, and you're going to have to be beating these AIs that are parsing resumes and things like that. And the best way to do that is to have a great portfolio, um, a strong network, and, and to really put yourself out there. So, um, you know, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I don't think anyone on this call uh, probably has as much as I did, but if you do, put yourself out there and, um, you know, just go for it. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Tommy. Those are super helpful tips. I didn't know that Amazon was pulling your analytics on the back end, but it makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, thanks for sharing all of your tips. All right, and up next is Megan. Well, like Tom said, I'm not sure how I'm gonna follow both of them, but <laughs> my experience is a little bit different. So hopefully I'll be able to bring in a couple other ideas um, and my, my focus is um, going to probably be more on the interpersonal side. Um, so my career started off as uh, an elementary ed um, classroom teacher, and I spent about nine years in elementary ed. But while I was there, uh, I was the teacher that was really interested in integrating technology. I was the teacher that everybody went to if they had questions about how to use any technology that they had, any of the new software programs that were adopted by the district. Um, so I constantly was in a role where I was providing training for other teachers, um, trying to find ways to troubleshoot problems and come up with solutions, coming up with creative solutions, you know, when we had um, smaller budgets and weren't able to get all the really flashy technology to use. I was figuring out ways to find low tech stuff to um, make it work in my classroom. Uh, while I was on a leave of absence um, from working for the school district of Lee County, uh, I decided to go back to school and pursue a doctorate degree in education. And so the, the programs that were available um, the one that, that called to me was uh, instructional technology and distance education. So I started a program at Nova Southeastern University doing that. And while I was taking classes there, um, several of my professors recommended joining a professional organization. Um, so I listened to them and, and I joined um, the Association for Educational Communications and Technology, um, also known as AECT for short there. And um, I started attending conferences in 2011. And most of my opportunity as an instructional designer have stemmed from my connections within AECT. So while I was taking courses, uh, one of the things I thought about was how am I going to go from being an elementary ed teacher to being an instructional designer in another area? Um, so I started looking for ways that I could get some experience Experience doing instructional design. And one opportunity that presented itself was through an internship with Basqua University. And I learned about that from an AECT member. Um, and so I was able to participate in a 12 week virtual internship with Basqua University in the UK. Obviously, I wasn't <laughs> traveling over there to do an internship, but I got paired with um, a learning technologist there and a faculty member and got to work on, on doing some you know, higher ed course design. And then because of that experience and being able to put that on my resume, um, when I um, found out about another contract or found out about a contract position at Florida Atlantic University, um, I you know, applied for that. And again, my connection with AECT, there was a member of AECT that I had previously met with and done some research with who was um, in charge of their learning design department and um, you know, found out that I applied for the position and I got hired for their contract position um, because of you know, having connections and she knew my work ethic and you know, that type of thing and, and there was a, a personal connection there. Um, then funny story, after I finished my contract at FAU, um, I started working for a university in Connecticut, post-university, and I um, got offered a position there as a, a full-time instructional designer in a remote capacity. So I live in, in Florida, so I worked the entire two years that I worked at Post, I worked in a remote capacity. Um, but that job I actually was approached for, um, I did not know that they were hiring, 
what happened was, is I was um, at car line pickup for one of my kids and I struck with my son's best friend's grandmother, who happened to be the associate provost of academic affairs. <laughs> And just was explaining to her basically what I did, you know, like I'm an instructional designer. I, you know, I design learning experiences for students and make it more engaging and interactive. And she remembered that. And so when her university was looking for an instructional designer, she let her director of instructional design know that she knew of somebody that did that type of work. And so her, she had her daughter reach out to me and see if I was looking for a job or if I was interested and that just happened to, to connect for, for, for working there. Um, fast forward, I um, resigned my position at post to continue working on my dissertation for my, um, my EDD. And while I was doing that, I just started picking up contract opportunities again. And one of my uh, former coworkers from post reached out and said, hey, I know of a contract position with Herzing University, they're looking for some um, learning designers to come in and help with a migration project. Um, we're migrating from Blackboard to Canvas. You know, is that something you're interested in? And um, so I got that opportunity offered based on knowing someone from, you know, working with someone and them knowing my work experience and my abilities. Um, and then after that first contract ended, um, because of the leadership role that I took on in the first contract, I got offered a second contract and I'm um, um, in the process of finishing up that contract right now. And that was working on designing a dental assisting program. So they had a, a campus-based program that they wanted to put into a hybrid program. So basically I took all of their didactic instruction, um, all the classroom instruction and put it online. And they still have a lab component that is going to be face-to-face. -face, although right now they're looking into other options um, for that because they're not able to have that that face-to-face -face component. Um, so most of my networking has been through AECT or through previous experiences. Um, so, you know, connections, just people, just talking with people. Um, one thing that happened over the last week, I've been contacted by two different people. Um, one person um, is someone who relocated to the area where I'm living and reached out through LinkedIn and said, hey, saw you're in the area, just wanted to say hi, let you know that I'm down here and I'm in consulting and coaching and wanted to reconnect with you. Um, so I don't know if anything will happen with that, um, you know, reconnection, but, you know, I responded back and, you know, definitely said hi and, you know, checked in, see what's going on. And then um, another opportunity presented itself today, actually, I got a call from a, a, a former coworker, and she heard I was looking for contract work, freelance work, and she has um, two courses that need to be developed between now and the fall um, because of the COVID-19 situation and wanted to find out if I was interested in doing that. So um, that I, is a possible opportunity that might, might occur. Um, so other ways that I've um, networked is by going through social media as well. Uh, I, and I, I have certain connections in certain places. So like my Twitter connection, that is mostly my ed tech people that I know or people in higher ed um, or industry, um, as well as LinkedIn um, is also those, those same types of people. If I wanna connect with my K-12 um, connections, most of them are on Facebook. Um, so if I like, a lot of what I've posted on my Facebook personally, like if anything that I've shared publicly, um, has been K-12 focused. Um, I've posted all kinds of different support webinars that are happening or materials that I found that I think would be relevant um, to K-12 teachers who are transitioning to remote teaching and have no background in that. Um, the other, um, the other, um, way I use um, Facebook is also, I'm also in a lot of the ID groups that Nicole mentioned as well. Um, and actually I've started looking into how I can diversify as well and um, working on continuing to develop my portfolio so that I can start to get into new areas. Um, but mostly what I recommend is um, being able to explain what you do um, and developing relationships, making connections with other classmates, with um, professors, with 
going going to professional conferences or if you can or attending webinars or reaching out and, and making those types of connections um, letting your connections know what type of work you're interested in um, because sometimes if they you know if they know that you're looking and you're actively looking for something if they hear of something they'll pass you information so I, I get emails or text messages all the time hey I found another position that you know might be well suited for you and so I constantly am getting emails or text messages from friends and and network in my network um, with opportunities. Um, one of the things I definitely say has been really important as and um, having interpersonal skills and having communication skills, being able to communicate effectively with what you need during a job and um, what you need in order to make things happen in a timely manner. And then people knowing that you have those types of skills, then they seek that out um, and know that you're able to communicate what needs to be done, um, having organizational skills as well, and being able to keep projects on track um, and knowing where to find things. So that's that's really important. You know, think about it if you're applying for a job, you know, keeping using those same types of organizational skills in applying for jobs or for contracts and having some type of system in place of keeping balance and check so you know like whether or not you've reached out and contacted people in a timely manner um, and documenting what you do so that if you are interacting with multiple people on different contracts that you know exactly where you are with each um, each person or each organization. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other suggestions I can give. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, everybody has such different experiences and backgrounds and tips and tricks. Um, this is really, really cool just to hear about it. I was a little nervous for a minute. You know, as I was before, before we got to today, like, oh, is everyone going to say the same thing? But I love how everyone's got a different message and different approaches and ideas. And this is really great. It's almost, I feel like a brainstorming session. I, I'm getting energized to go out and uh, polish up my profiles. <laughs> so David, you're up next. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Koster. I'm coming to you from my home office in Mooresville, North Carolina. Good to have everyone on board. Um, currently, I, I own a company called Team Learning Services, and um, we do consulting and services in instructional design and employee lifecycle uh, development, usually around, mostly around employee onboarding programs. But this comes from a long history of being an instructional designer, as you see there, about 25 years. Uh, that's been a varied experiences in corporate, um, academic, government, and now I consider myself more of a business consultant rather than an ID, but all of the work that I do really revolves around that instructional design and training learning development. Um, but if I use that language to my clients, they get lost. So I'll get into that a little bit, but um, to always consider it's important to pick up the language of your clients rather than your jargon. And I know Nicole mentioned that earlier and some of the others have too. I also, uh, as many of you have mentioned, a uh, high school science and math teacher. And after three years, I thought, okay, this is probably not my long-term um, uh, prospect. So I went back to um, master's program at University of Central Florida uh, to get my master's in instructional systems design. Now, this was 1992, so my approach is slightly different from many of you, the rest of you, but um, if you switch the slide, I'll get into my networking. So going back then, obviously pre-LinkedIn, Facebook, and pretty much internet in general, my network strategies were really around getting to know my classmates, professors, and coworkers, and I was fortunate this uh, University of Central Florida, for those of you who don't know, is in Orlando, and at the time, probably still, had a really strong uh, community for instructional design, and probably within a mile or two of the university was a huge infrastructure for uh, instructional design and engineering, probably mostly because we were so close to Kennedy Space Center. But um, what happened to me, my very first day of my very first class in my master's program, one of my classmates, I had no idea who she was, stood up in the middle of class and said, hey, if anyone's interested in a job, I'm working for a company that's half a mile from here. 
they're looking for IDs. So if anybody's interested, go apply. So I thought, okay, well, I might as well. But like Tommy said, you know, you no experience. So I just went, applied, got the job. And I started learning immediately. Um, and, and I thought, okay, this is great. This is a lesson learned because now it's telling me really get close to the, anybody, everybody that I encounter in this program because we don't all come from the same places. We're not all doing the same things. Therefore, we have an opportunity to really create a, a, a spider web of contacts that's entirely invaluable. I mean, you could not put a value on that. Again, as others have said, join professional organizations, attend their meetings, become as active as you can, be a thought leader, be a contributor as much as you can. Those are really valuable. And the, the, probably the biggest lesson I learned to networking was say yes to everything. So if somebody offers you a job, say yes. If somebody says, hey, I want you to come attend a meeting, say yes. Um, I talk to this person, say yes. If you can say yes to everything early on, you will gain uh, credibility, you'll gain contacts, and you'll learn a ton. So definitely how I got uh, started. Now, very much do the same things. Uh, not a lot has changed, um, uh, other than I've added some my LinkedIn and some other social media groups, but not being a uh, person of that era, it's a little bit more challenging for me. I'm sure that, that some of you are gonna be much better at it than I, uh, than I was, but um, it's still a, a, an invaluable uh, strategy. So some things I learned is uh, really figured out where job openings were, um, you know, how to get jobs to, to find, because if you know someone that's working there, you get an inside track on it, not only about an opening, but what's, what's the job like, and you're not going in blindly, you're, you're having uh, some insider information, which is, which is very good to have. A lot of tools, the trade tricks, tips and trends, you know, just try to, to learn as much as you can. Always open your mind and your eyes and your ears. And the old saying of listen more than you speak is very important. And give back whenever possible. If you have a chance to help someone else along the way, um, please do. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, and I, I, I made myself another note. What I'm doing now is business consulting. So I had to uh, transition very quickly from being an instructional designer to, to being a business solutions provider. And as I mentioned before, you, a, a bit of advice that I would give to everybody is, as you are getting jobs, as you're applying your craft, learn the business aspects of what you're doing. Get out of your role, get out of your bubble, and learn the reasons why you're doing what you're doing. Make notes of those things, kind of put them in the back of your mind, and then if you do get to a place where you need to sell the value of your ID work and your training work and your learning development, you'll already be in tune to what that is. And it's really important because when you sit down with a client, whether it be an internal or external client, and you start talking ID language, you're going to lose them. You really need to focus in on that business language, talk about what they, what's important to them, and you have this you have the secrets they don't need to know all the secrets they just need to know what you're going to do to solve their problems so good luck if i can help anyone along the way um, another bit of networking is this little background i have hopefully it looks all right uh, it's kind of a new thing that somebody told me about um, great idea to put your information right there so if somebody wants to contact you they don't have to guess who you are how to get hold of you it's uh, it's right there for them so good luck be glad to help out where I can. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I think that that's super wise. I always say yes to everything. Even if you know training isn't the solution, uh, I used to have clients come to me and say, hey, can you make this training? <laughs> I would say yes and let's talk about what that might look like and as, as, as the the process part of the process of creating that training you you help them come to realize that there might be other decisions that are also needed as you develop the training um, and that way you can work a little more systemically um, to ensure that you're also closing the performance gap um, 
So I, I really appreciate the, the yes to everything. Um, and uh, your classmates and professors and coworkers. I, I also, believe it or not, come from a time before we had social, social media. <laughs> And uh, those contacts um, provided to, proved to be invaluable as well um, to me. So thank, thank you so much. Um, lots of gems today. I really appreciate your contributions. Uh, Jennifer, you're up. Um, so I was going to say I can't agree more with Lisa and David about saying yes, um, be a solution provider. I am like many others. Um, I'm actually from a traditional education background. I started out in early childhood education. Um, I was actually working with children with autism in Canada. I heard there are some Canadians here, so love Canadians. Um, and I found out that I was actually more interested in providing curriculum design. Uh, at that time, I didn't know what's instructional design. I have no idea about working with technologies, but I know I'm interested in working with technologies. So I went back to school, um, did a master's program in educational psychology, and met my professor there who told me about instructional design. So then I found out there's actually an instructional design program back in Kentucky, where I'm living right now. So I got very excited. I got enrolled. and. In 2010, I started my program and I graduated in 2012. Since then, I work in different fields, a lot in higher ed, um, as well as manufacturing facilities. My latest client, client is actually with Johnny Rockets and they are a franchise restaurant in the United States. Great group to work with, really love working with them. So um, in terms of my strategies, uh, when I graduated, I quickly realized that um, not that many people know what instructional designers are. I still had people reaching out to me, actually last week, from Indeed, asking me to apply for a fashion designer position. So at that time, I realized, hey, if I, am, I need to apply for jobs, I need to tell people uh, what I want to do. So developing an elevator pitch talking about your values, your strength, and think about your weaknesses. What are you really interested in doing? What kind of problems do you want to solve for people? And the second step I did was I reached out to my LinkedIn network and I told my LinkedIn network about uh, what I want to do and how I would like to help out. I actually met a recruiter there online. We got connected. And I met her in person at the local job club. And she happened to be looking for an instructional designer position. So that's actually how I got my first corporate job. It's with a company called The Big Ass Fans. It's a real company, I promise. Um, so love um, my first corporate job. And the second thing I would like to share is just my long-term strategies. Um, so. Uh, I saw in the chat box, someone was asking about industry, working in different industries. So if there is an industry that you are interested in working in, or let's say a company, I would say really research different organizations and identify those companies or clients if you want to be a freelancer. Um, a lot of times it's helpful for the employer um, to know, to have the same language. If there are research out there, find them and study them. That will help you uh, use the same language and communicate with your client or future employer and talk about the problems and the solutions you want to provide. The last one I want to say is just collaborating with other professionals. Um, I, when I did my MBA, I had a class. Uh, Oh, that's um, unfortunate. Right, looks like our connection with Jennifer Chen is not coming back soon. So um, maybe we will have time to circle back around at the end. Next up is Vanessa. Thank you, Jennifer, by the way, for all of your insight. Um, I appreciate that. And um, I, I find the, the your first organization job title or uh, to be really funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Same. 
Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Vanessa Alzate, the president and CEO of Anchor Training. Um, so I graduated from Rutgers in 2008, just in time for the huge economic crash, um, where no one was really finding jobs, um, let alone someone coming out with a major in political science and communications. Thought I was going to be Elwoods, but then decided law school was not for me unfortunately for my lawyer father. Um, so I made a list of everything that I liked to do while I was in college. Um, so I was in a sorority um, in college and I was also on the council that governs all the sororities. So I had a few different um, volunteer positions and leadership positions that I was able to pull some um, key skills and projects that I like to work on. And those are my keyword search terms when I uh, started looking for jobs and training was one of them. Um, and it took a while and about six months in, I, on Craigslist of all places, I found um, a corporate training job with a software company. They said, we will train you, you don't need any experience. Um, so I went in and I did a, um, a mock training on my second interview and I ended up uh, starting to work there. And anybody that knows me knows that software training would have been like the farthest thing for me to start out doing. but. I was a software trainer and there I learned um, all the different facets of training, um, including um, training documentation, um, actually training in the classroom, training virtually, and then e-learning. And I hated e-learning actually. Um, and it was more because of the tool that we were using and I was the voice for it and I didn't wanna actually have to edit myself all day. So eventually we had to switch over to Captivate um, and I started to like it more. And when I left that job, um, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, um, said to me, hey, you should reach out to Lisa and let her know that um, you, you could do um, Captivate work nights and weekends while you're working full time. And Lisa um, owned a training company um, where we would contract trainers through her when we had big rollout trainings. And I said, you know what, that's actually a really good idea. She and I got along really well. Um, and I did. And she's like, absolutely. Um, I'll pass along things as you are doing them right now. I'm doing them. Um, and I guess that at the time, I thought that her company was a lot bigger than what it actually was. And now, um, yeah, thank you. Um, that's actually a picture of her and I at her 15 year um, anniversary party just last, um, just last month. So when we met, her company was only four years old. But I had this vision in my head that it was a lot bigger. Um, and so she and I were able to grow together um, and it really kind of snowballed. So I um, had full-time jobs and worked nights and weekends. Um, and one of those years, I also got my two-year master's in one year. So it was a little bit of a crazy year. Um, so I did a lot of that until um, 2018. So 2016 and 17, I had my two daughters and I remember being, nine months pregnant at Lisa's office. And um, I had my, my, my oldest with me. And I looked at her and I said, do you think that you're gonna have enough work for me so that I can like supplement my income or you know replace my income from working full time? And she looked at me and said, yes, you'll be fine. I was still crazy. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna go back to work for like a minute and see how I could do this with two kids. Spoiler alert, you can't, it's very hard. <laughs> so um, I ended up um, leaving my full-time position and opening up officially anchored training. During those years, I was also cultivating some relationships with other, cu with other customers and other clients. Um, so my sorority is now actually one of my clients um, and I do all of their e-learning for them and I have a few others that I work with um, pretty exclusively. So um, definitely my um, biggest tip for you is like everyone is saying, is to tell everyone, um, you know, past people that you've worked with, um, just tell your friends, tell your family. My cousin's a makeup artist. She's a, she works all over the tri-state area. She meets so many people and she has given my um, information out to so many people. So I make sure that I keep filling her um, wallet up with my cards. Um, so definitely that. And just like everyone said, those ID Facebook groups um, are so important. Um, for me, recently, what I've really started to get um, 
into is getting myself out there and getting in front of local businesses. Um, so for me, I've been working a lot with our local um, ATD chapter and um, with the Middlesex County uh, Chamber of Commerce. And I actually um, am sitting on a few committees for both of those groups. Um, so when I join something, you know, I kind of go all in and I will join it and really in ingrate myself as a member. Um, I wish I did it sooner. Um, I, I wish I had started when I was earlier in my career. I think I was super crazy busy um, with Lisa and I was, um, I think that I can be extroverted, but I'm really an introverted person. And so I'm super nervous, like going into a new um, situation, like having to go like by myself to a networking event. Um, but you just, recently I shared with someone that I think that when I have to get up and speak in front of someone, I just turn into a different person, kind of like how Beyonce has her alter ego. Um, and that's kind of what you need to be when, um, you know, if you do get shy and you are nervous about putting yourself out there in front of other people and understand that a lot of those other people in the room are probably feeling the same way. Um, and I've made some really, really great connections that way. And I don't even try to go in there with the, with the hard sell or anything like that. My last tip um, is having a culture of care, and that's how I really run my business. Um, so now we're more of an agency where I um, subcontract to other um, freelancers, and I'm the one that's out there getting the work. But whenever we work with our customers, it's all about um, ingraining ourselves ourselves in their business. And I don't want to just talk about our projects. Like I want to get to know you as a person, because like Nicole said, people want to work with people that they know and. Uh, people that they connect with. You could have the greatest qualifications, but if you don't jive with that person, you're not going to get the job. Um, so I try to always approach our customers um, where I really care about them. And um, I truly do. I want to get to know them and I want our interactions to be more than just business because that just makes it more fun for me. Um, and then the last thing about finding your tribe is find those people that you can talk to about what you're going through um, because a lot of people don't know instructional design. Um, so I have found a few different people through uh, social media networks and things like that, that I can say, I'm so annoyed because Articulate doesn't do this. And they actually understand what I'm talking about. Or they'll give me a suggestion. If I said that to my mother who still thinks that I just work on PowerPoints, it's, it's not gonna go anywhere. So definitely uh, work on finding your tribe. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. That's great. Uh, I can totally relate to a lot of what you said. Um, and yeah, I think just trying to find out and learn about people. A couple of people have mentioned that, that culture of care, that, you know, honest curiosity about what's going on in other people's lives and how you can help them um, make make life a little bit less painful from day to day, you know, they really respect that and, um, and it, it resonates. It resonates. So thank you so much. And Kara. Hey, um, thank you for and having me on. You guys hear me okay? I feel like that's the default when you get uh, unmuted. Um, so I probably have the least amount of experience out of everyone on this panel, and I am not a freelancer. I have never worked a contract gig. Um, I don't know that I ever will. Um, you guys all are braver than I am. I like having a steady month to month paycheck, but you know, to each, to each their own. I say that now, but we'll see where I end up in a couple of years. Um, I have worked in the industry for about five years, almost six, um, depending on a couple of jobs I've had and what, how you categorize them. But I have worked primarily, I just started working at the University of Florida um, for their HR training and organizational development team. I started in January, so I'm pretty new to that realm um but i uh like it pretty well it's very different from my corporate experience but um a lot of the work is the same i work with teams that um, are developing training for their staff and their faculty on on professional development so kind of still like the corporate side of the university work um, i'm not doing um, curriculum development for students i don't talk to students at all um, except for right now, I guess <laughs> I'm talking to students right now, um, but I don't talk with the University of Florida. So um, I got into instructional design um, on accident. I don't know if you've read, Cami Bean has a book called The Accidental Instructional Designer, and I feel like that 
story that she tells about how she became an instructional designer really resonates with my my story. I started at the company um, Conservis. It's in Cache Valley, Utah. It's pretty small. I started there just doing data entry part time while I was finishing my undergraduate degree, um, which is in music. So really uh, translated to instructional design. Um, and, and a job op opportunity opened up on the training team to do entry level training. And um, after I graduated, I needed some full time work um, to uh, make ends meet while my husband finished his degree. So, so I took the opportunity on the training team. And uh, this is this is great. This is exactly what my strategy I wanted to share was. Um, from that job, just teaching people how to do their entry level job, I was able to move into an e-learning position where I then became the supervisor of the e-learning team and was working with graphic designers, videographers, cinematographers, technical writers, and coordinating all the efforts for our company. Um, and a lot of that all stemmed just from that one like gateway position as a trainer. I was able to build really strong connections with, with my leadership and his leadership and therefore senior leadership got my name out there i didn't have any like technical experience i didn't know anything about the adobe creative suite but i knew um instructional design principles pretty well and i could break down complex uh topics and they like to hire from within so i got a pretty good advantage just um they kind of took a little bit of a risk hiring someone who didn't have technical skills but as my my she became my mentor later said you can teach technical skills um some of those softer skills are harder to teach so that's going to be my other uh plug some people have said uh say yes to everything if you don't know how to do it just remember you don't know how to do it yet um especially if there are like little technical things that you need to learn youtube has everything like you can google just about anything um so have faith in yourself and 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 say yes and remember technical skills they i mean they take they take practice but they're on the internet you can find them anywhere so i um, was able to build a pretty robust portfolio at that position which led me to come in at university of florida as a fresh candidate and i was actually hired for a position that they usually hire internally for because i had such a robust portfolio so that's my big uh, my my big short term strategy is if you have a job right now and you're looking to get more into ID or training, look for opportunities now. I think I think uh, Dave touched on this a little bit. I think everyone's kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, people don't know that they need instructional designers. They don't know that vocabulary. They don't know what those problems are. Um, they don't they don't know what they don't know so look for opportunities where you can see what well, could training fix that or could a job aid fix that or um, could process design enhancement fix that and, and what can you do what can you offer um, to kind of build up that reputation and then more opportunities can come from there uh, my second strategy that I wanted to plug in the short term is to attend a conference if you can um, Adobe has a free conference every year I they have it in Las Vegas and in Washington, D.C., so I don't know where you guys are camped. I went to the one in Las Vegas last October, um, and it's free. I mean, you have to pay for, for lodging and, and how to get there, but the actual attendance is free, so it's a pretty easy sell for your organization if you have one. Um, mine paid for my attendance. Um, or to self-fund if, if that's um, an option for you. I met a lot of of really great people at that conference and learned a lot of skills. And I also realized um, that I actually knew a lot more than I thought I did. Um, so someone asked in the chat, how do you know when you're ready to move into paid work? Um, I would say you're probably ready right now. Um, and you just don't think it because you think you're still new and you're still learning. Um, and a lot of people feel that way and you're probably gonna feel that way forever. So um, trust that you do know a lot of things and and that that switch for me was at a conference when i went to uh, a conference i was in a session and i realized that i knew a lot about what they were talking about i know my stuff and and that was a really validating experience for me um similar to everyone else join a facebook or linkedin group um 
not just instructional designers, I think Nicole touched on industry, the industries that you want to be in, um, or people that are in similar situations as you. I'm part of a Facebook group where I've, I've reached out with a lot of connections and been able to make um, some good connections with people in very different experiences that can, we could kind of brainstorm together, um, just because it's like a working moms group. <laughs> so you can find these connections in, in weird places. Um, if you're looking for them. Uh, and then my long term, I'll just try to wrap these up quickly because I know we're over time, but um, try to maintain your connections from previous gigs. Um, make friends with the people you work with. Nicole said like people like to work with people they know um, and they want you to work or you want to work with people. You want to work with people, you know, anyway, but, but be friends. Like don't try to have these like phony, like really shallow connections. Um, it's better to have a few good, or not a few, have a lot of good connections, but it's better to have a few good ones than, than a lot of really shallow ones. Um, some connections better than none, but anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, and then accept an opportunity that maybe has more potential rather than trying to look to step up the career ladder. Um, I had an opportunity when I moved into e-learning from that training position. I could have moved up into a leadership position um, and I took the lateral move over because I knew I was going to get more experience and more skills. So even though my pay didn't change very much and it would have changed quite a bit to move up and it was really hard at that time because I was really, really poor <laughs> to say no to that raise. Um, making that step over to e-learning and being able to develop those skills really slingshotted my career. So don't be afraid to take Take things that maybe are a little less, uh, we were chatting a little before we started about if you have to do it all, you get paid less because organizations are smaller. Maybe that's okay to do for a little bit so that you can develop a little bit of all those skills and become well-versed in everything. So um, yeah, that's, that's me. Uh, those are my strategies. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kara. Um, yeah, I remember my first job actually right after my master's degree, I got done with it, was I applied um, for a job at a community college in workforce development, um, the workforce development and training office, and it required only an associate degree. But it was 2002, there was a recession, and I wasn't going to be proud. You know what I mean? And so I put my application in and there was an internal candidate. Um, which is very hard to overcome, um, but it happens and I, I got the offer. Um, so, and that kind of let me have a foot in the door in the, the higher education realm, which opened a lot of other doors. So yeah, um, it, you know, it didn't pay a lot of money, but it provided me with a lot of experience and, um, and sometimes that's more important. Um, than getting something that looks high powered on a resume. <laughs> so thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, we've had so many gifts from everyone here that's talked today. I really, really appreciate you. I was telling these guys before, you know, it's, it's really hard out there right now um, for everyone, all of us. Uh, people are losing their jobs. People are having to work at home without childcare. People, their families and friends are losing their jobs. Um, so the fact that you guys all tuned in today, um, I really, really appreciate your time um, and your gifts of knowledge and wisdom and you're sharing your experiences. I know that our audience also um, values your, your words and your, your cheerleading and, and support. So thank you so much. Um, and I would like to open this up. Um, if you need to leave, because we are over time, um, please, you know, hop off the call. If you'd like to stay, I definitely would love uh, to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. I'll stay. So even if everybody leaves, I'll still answer some questions the best I can, uh, given my perspective. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you do would like uh, to ask a question, so I have to apologize. Um, uh, we, I had to allow, allow people back into the room. And so I, I wasn't able really to keep an eye on your questions. So if we've accidentally missed you and you still have a question, could you please type it in the chat box again or unmute yourself? And um, maybe just if you have the hand raise signal, um, we can start addressing people's questions one by one. So it looks like um, Sabrina's asking, I keep running into 
uh, across positions that are requiring PMP or Agile certifications? Is this something others have come across? Anybody want to field that? Um, I can because I work in an Agile organization, I guess. Um, I think you'll notice with a lot of instructional design related positions, there's a laundry list of qualifications they're asking for. Um, I, I don't think, I think it, you know, I, I've never felt compelled to go out and get one of those certifications um, mm -hmm. in order to find work because I'm not a project, I'm not a project manager. And those certifications are designed so that um, you can be more than an individual contributor on a project team, but actually um, in terms of Agile, be the, serve as like a scrum master or a product owner. So those are specialist positions. So if I was looking at a job description asking for those credentials, I would wanna ask, why is that level of project management, you know, uh, skill required? and how would that be utilized in the role? And is that something I wanna do? Because I know if I see that, those qualifications as like a uh, must have, that means I'm assuming it's a very project management heavy role and it's definitely not something I'd wanna be doing. Um, but I guess that would be kind of what would come across my mind if I saw that. Yeah, that's. I was gonna say that, I would add that too, um, is you really do wanna be, be it's easy to think, man, I want to be everything to all people because the wider net that I can cast, the more jobs I'll be qualified for. But just keep in mind that, you know, either it's not something that you have the aptitude for, or you have the interest for, and you get caught up in an expectation of the job that you're going to be something that either you're, you're not prepared for or they just keep piling more work on you and, you, you know, it becomes a losing, losing uh, proposition. Mm -hmm. I think also you could, um, if you can reach back out to ask some of those questions, um, because realize that a lot of times it's a recruiter that knows nothing about instructional design is just picking up on some buzzwords and some things that they hear that are kind of piecing together what this job description should look like. Um, and agile is definitely one of those like big buzzwords right now in the industry. Um, and that's might have been how that ended up there. So definitely follow do some follow up. To Vanessa's point about portfolios and recruiters, I literally have two different websites. One, to get past phone screens and that initial recruiter who knows nothing about the field, and another one for hiring managers who are usually like in industry. Um, just know that you're, you're going to be dealing with that. And um, so what I do is I have a portfolio that's literally just a simple web page and it has a lot of like flashy graphics and graphic design work I've done that shows, Hey, he can design things literally like all there on a page. There's not no clicks um, just to splash it in front of them so that, you know, everybody knows what good design looks like, even if they know nothing about instructional design. So that's been kind of my strategy for getting through those that round uh, <laughs> of questioning, but um, the the whole phone screen thing, that's that's probably, I think, the hardest part of the interviewing process is getting through the gatekeeper and um, trying to sell somebody who may not know anything about your field on your expertise, so. Uh, I remember when I was um, jumping through those hoops, I would um, look at the job call and the job description and change the vocabulary I would use <laughs> to meet the client's uh, expectations and needs. Yeah. Um, Naya is asking if you can, if, uh, I don't know if we were trying to address this question or not, so help me out there, but if you can uh, talk more about your portfolio and what designs you have included, anyone um, wanna? Yeah, um, so I replied back about my portfolio. So in my portfolio, um, I have a technical, like a software simulation piece, um, an explainer video, and a couple of soft skills that showcase a few different types of um, interactions that we've included and things like that. Um, honestly, my portfolio pieces um, are actually not my best work. A lot of my best work has been proprietary. Um, but that being said, um, I also don't think that you, I, a lot of people put a lot of um, pressure on themselves for their portfolio. I think if you can come out with two to three great pieces and it doesn't have to be a ton of stuff. No one is going to go through three 15 minute modules to see how, what work you can do. They're gonna look at three to five slides at most. 
So make sure that you, um, you know, hit them with a bang right from the beginning. And then just a couple of pieces to get started. And then you're good to go until you can build. And if you can scrub something that may be proprietary so that um, you get rid of any of your client's information, great. If not, pick a topic that you're going to be, that you're passionate about and write and write about that. And then there's, you know, if you can't think of three different things to come up with, um, you could even try the same topic and just showcasing it in a few different ways. So let's say you're showing someone how to do a chart in Excel. One of them could be a straight video. One could be um, interactive simulation. And then the third one, maybe it's a game or something like that. But that, at least that way you can showcase um, some different um, types of theories. And that's kind of cool because it shows that you could take the same information and give the client anything that they need with it. I literally, when I started my portfolio, could not use anything I ever made for a client. So everything I had to make from scratch and um, my strategy was to use it as a sales piece. So every piece in my portfolio that I had to build separately is like an, why would you use an instructional designer kind of thought piece? So there's like a game about why you might use one and there's some other stuff. And then it goes through my rationale um, and the only other thing I did do, because I obviously couldn't put like, you know, the, how to fly, well, the buttons in the cockpit, right? I can't really put that up for everyone to see. My, my aviation clients wouldn't be too happy about that. So um, what I did is I just have a really long list of like every project I've ever worked on without client names. And that also, you know, it's, it's, if you're not an instructional designer, you're just very impressed by anything that kind of says you do instructional design and they look at the list and they see it's like 200 titles long and they're like, wow, <laughs> and that's enough. So um, I think Vanessa's advice is really good. Don't go overboard. And also if you don't have stuff, just think about who that dream client or dream um, employer would be and target your stuff to them. I, yeah, I really appreciate that advice. I tell um, students in my e-learning development, rapid e-learning development course all the time, like, think about who you want to, who you want to work for and make something that they might need so that they can see you in their organization. I love that you just said that. I, I say that all the time. Let's see, are there any other questions? I'm, I'm looking at this one that Rachel wrote about the short term, the long term, and I'd, I'd okay. enjoy hearing what, what people's um, responses are, their insights are. I think this is just going to open up a lot of new jobs for IDs personally, but um, what do you guys think? Uh, I'm turning, I'm turning away freelance work right now. Um, I'm still getting contacted for corporate roles. So I know it's hiring has slowed down for a lot of people, but I, I have seen it stay strong for me and some of the other e-learning companies and other folks I've talked to in the corporate field have said, you know, they're hiring for these positions and they're growing. So I think the fact that we've been able, most of us have been able to weather the storm mm -hmm. for the most part says a lot about this field and the sustainability of it. I'm, ex I'm excited to see what comes. <laughs> Nobody knew what I did for years. My parents didn't understand what I did. Now everybody knows, oh, you're an e-learning. Teach me how to use Zoom. You know, so it, I've, I'm not used to this kind of exposure. That's for sure. I love that the hashtag on Instagram, hashtag e-learning has blown up, but not really like from e-learning that we do. It's because like the kids are all, you know, in school doing their e-learning. Um, so everyone thinks that they know what e-learning is, but um, I agree. I think that it's just going to blow up. And I think um, as companies deal with what um, recession may come, um, what they'll typically um you know, what we've seen is that they will cut staff, but the work still has to get done. People still have to get trained. So who do they use? They use um, contractors um, a lot of the time to supplement that. So they don't have to go ahead and pay them insurance and all of that really fun stuff. Um, so another tip I didn't get to share um, that I heard from someone else is um, to search for companies, um, like an agency like mine almost, right? That we sub out work to other people um, where, you know, they could hire you as a instructional designer, they're looking for instructional designers, they're looking to put you in an e-learning contractor pool, you know, whatever kind of area you're in, because then when they get a new customer and they're looking for an instructional designer in that project, you'll be part of that pool that they could pick from. Um, so that's also a really good way to um, kind of get in the door, especially during a time like this. Awesome, yeah. These are all such great uh, tips and tricks. Let's see, we'll take, um, if anybody has time to answer a few more questions. So what if you're not into e-learning, how do you approach your portfolio? 
Anybody want to have a suggestion there? I guess it depends lens also if you want to be in e-learning. So if you want to be in e-learning, you probably should think about trying to figure out how to get something up there. Um, I'm not sure if you're an Opal person or somebody who heard about this from um, just some of the Facebook groups, uh, this presentation, but we do have a course in Opal that teaches you how to use both uh, a Captivate and um, Storyline. And at the end of the course, you have four products that you can post on your portfolio in public. So um, it's a 10 week course uh, and you don't, I don't think you have to take anything before you take that. So that's an option um, if you want to get into your learning. But again, if you don't want to do e-learning, you want to do more ILT stuff, um, then you will want to show off your ILT stuff or your HPT projects, maybe a program logic model, how you use the BEM, that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I'd love to hear what other people have to say about that too. Yeah, I am. Um... So I can do e-learning, I've created tons of it. I think most of my clients still come to me for e-learning solutions. But what I would say is that you can position yourself to be the strategist. So I can help you figure out, you know, what you want to be doing, what should be e-learning, what should be VILT, what should be ILT, what should be a poster on your wall and not training at all, what should be a, a conversation between employees. And then I can hand it off to somebody who's really good at doing the development and design or partner with somebody who's really good at the, you know, the other stuff. And that's fine too. I mean, there are clients who will come to you not for e-learning at all. There's still plenty out there um, for that kind of work, but definitely what you said, Lisa, just making sure that if that's what you want to do, then use that language in like your LinkedIn profile and your website. Don't like emphasize e-learning and all of that other stuff because then those clients will come to you. I dislike e-learning. You know, it's just not my thing, but I did find a platform called is easy. I S E A Z Y something like that. And um, it's, it's pretty, it's easy. It's basic. It's, it's very simple, but it allowed me to put something together that, it got me in the game without me being a you know an e-learning developer, and the other thing that um, that I've that I have done that's resonated with a few clients is talking about being a I don't I don't know if there's a real word for it, but I called it like a continuity expert, and the way I framed it was you know there, you you have a design documentation uh, a design document or a, a lesson plan or curriculum plan, and as the IDs are working on developing the material, a lot of times you lose the A to Z, right? You know, you're, you're supposed to be on that path that's taking you to the objectives. But a lot of times in the, as you hand off, it's kind of like the telephone tag game. You know, you, it goes through various hands and you lose that. And I think it's something that those of us with that ability uh, can sell that talent um, as being that continuity guy that says, hey, I can look at A and get you to Z without, you know, you being all over the place and, and having it be a straight line. And I think there's some value in that. Uh, if you want to think about if you have that skill and how you can uh, kind of promote that. So I agree with um, both Nicole and David. It's really about thinking about what you like to do and being able to talk about those. So another way might be good is to do some case studies. Um, I recently was um, looking at Leo Learning. They're a really good e-learning company and they have some great case studies talking about how they solve performance issues. And, you know, just not necessarily e-learning, but on the other side of curriculum design, performance consultation. So just a thought. Did you say Leo, L-E-O? Yes. Yeah, okay. L-E-O. Like design, Leo design. Awesome, thank you. The same, the same thing. Um, Really, I like I don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of e-learning experience at all. It's basically whatever I did during my doc program. And that was back when um, Articulate was not um, online. <laughs> so um, mo my portfolio has, you know, descriptions of ways that I've created solutions. So for example, 
um, a history or a civilizations course that we were working on. We had a multimedia team at um, the university that I was working at, but I came up with the idea of how to take the content and make it interactive. And then they made it, they built it. Our, our multimedia developers built it. So I have those types of skills where I can come up with the creative solutions, but I might not necessarily have the technical skills to get the solution created. Um, so just deciding what, like everyone else said, what is it that you specifically want to do? And then providing that those types of examples on your portfolio. Yeah, great. Let's see. Are there any other questions? Um, I think we might have the, oh, all the presenter. Yes, everybody's portfolio uh, website, LinkedIn or Facebook or something. I think everybody's up there. Um, I also, um, I can tell you from experience that if you start typing their names into Google and instructional design, their stuff comes up too, because <laughs> I did that. So uh, there's lots of ways to find those things. You can replay the webinar when we get back, uh, get it posted online, and you can also start just Googling people's names and the word instructional designer or performance improvement or business consultant in David's uh, background. I think he's got his contact information right up on the screen too. Thank you so much. Make it easy for everybody. Um, well, I think we've come to the end. Um, again, I apologize for going over, but I think our audience uh, probably really, really appreciates it. They're still here. I'll be following up with everybody. Now that I've gotten a chance to really hear your stories, I want to hear more um, and, uh, and kind of follow you along. This was super interesting for me too. I feel like I, I picked up on some tips and tricks um, as well to add to my tool set. So, Thank you to everybody who um, shared their wisdom and knowledge and thanks for taking time out of your busy days to come and also to our audience for some great interaction and excellent questions.